Good afternoon. My name's Alana Rabello, and I'm going to be speaking on saving lives, why government, businesses and communities must invest in wetland restoration. I'd like to thank Bonani for inviting me to give this presentation and for crafting this title and the scope of the presentation, and also to Lulu and Donovan for inputs into this talk. So I'd like to start with defining the scope of wetlands for my presentation. And looking at the definition from the National Water Act, um, wetlands are the land which is transitional between terrestrial and aquatic systems. And the Ramsar definition, which talks of areas of marsh, fen and peatland. And importantly, the Ramsar definition includes riparian and coastal zones adjacent to wetlands. We have um, two, at least two, uh, really good wetland classification systems. And both of these speak to um, a more holistic view of wetlands. Um, it, for example, with a channeled valley bottom wetland um, incorporating the river as part of that system. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be taking a holistic view of wetlands, including riparian systems, rivers, but also the groundwater system that underpins wetlands. And this is, I think, critical when you're considering wetland restoration, that we don't think of wetlands in a discontinuous sense, that they're just these little pieces and fragments in a landscape, but that they're really integrated and um, part of an entire catchment. So why are wetlands important? I think that this meme captures it all. So feel free to have a look at this while I'm talking. But um, this year's World Wetlands Day, um, Ramsar came up with this concept of wetlands, um, these concepts being inseparable, water, wetlands and life. And this is because water is the pillar of social and economic development. And wetlands are critical because they store and purify fresh water and as well as providing home to biodiversity. And the key theme of this is that everything is connected. So before we look at wetland restoration, I would just like to briefly take us through um, the theory behind ecosystem restoration as being something that is very well um, standardized globally. And there are guidelines and primers available, as in this paper that I've shared on the screen. And the Society for Ecosystem or Ecological Restoration, SER, defines restoration as the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged or restored. And the concept underpinning this is really this ball and cup model from ecology, where we've got ecosystem state here from degraded through to intact, as well as the functioning of that ecosystem from non-functional to fully functional. And in state one, we have a um, wetland that is um, intact and highly functional. And if there's some perturbation, for example, some alien trees start invading some black wattle, it can move to a less functional state and, and slightly more degraded state. But it hasn't yet crossed any thresholds or barriers. And so to improve this condition, you only need perhaps some management. So going in quickly, removing those trees before they set seed, um, and you might be able to return your wetland to its original state. However, if you ignore the situation and the wetland degrades further, the trees start to set seed, the seed banks get full of alien seeds, and you cross a biotic barrier. And once you Across this barrier, it's not a simple um, process of restoration, you actually need biological modification. So for example, you might need to go and um, start to clear those invasive alien trees and consider follow up, um, considering also the fire regime, but there's quite a substantial lot, amount more energy to get it back to this original state. However, if you ignore the, sister, the situation further and it degrades even further, it can actually cross an abiotic barrier and end up in this very degraded and non-functional state. And this requires really significant energy and effort and finances to get it back to the, any kind of state, any kind of better state. And this often requires physical and chemical modification. And this speaks to the restorative continuum, where there's a continuum of restoration all the way from reducing impacts through remediation, through rehabilitation to ecological restoration. And each of these words have specific meanings that are really critical. When we talk about restoration, we're talking about initiating native recovery or partially recovering the system or fully recovering it. And it really speaks to biodiversity, not just ecosystem function. If you're talking only ecosystem function, usually 
it's about rehabilitation. And if you're talking about just offsetting or reducing impacts, you're at the lowest end of the restorative continuum. And where you target, which type of intervention you target will depend very much on the state of the damage, but also the aims of the restoration. There are also very important principles underpinning restoration. It's not just um, slapdash, it has to be holistic, involves stakeholders, draw on different types of knowledge, informed by native reference systems. So it's very scientific, supporting ecosystem recovery processes, have clear goals. Again, the science comes in seeking the highest level of recovery possible. Um, gaining cumulative value when applied at scale and being part of a continuum of activities. And the re most recent tool globally available for this is the five star recovery wheel, where you can assess each of these aspects like physical conditions and ecosystem function on a scale of one to five, where you set your targets at the start of the project and you monitor the indicators throughout. So this is quite a useful tool. So now that we've looked at a bit of the theory of restoration, why is wetland restoration even necessary in South Africa? Well, our wetlands are in a pretty bad state. So most of our landscape is quite degraded. 50% of our e wetland ecosystems are critically endangered and we've lost about 50% of our original wetland extent. So things are looking very dire for our wetland ecosystems and even worse, um, most of them are not protected at all. So things could be getting worse in the future and some key threats invasive alien plants, erosion, developments, draining of wetlands, pollution, inappropriate fire regimes, and mining. So this is the key part of my talk today. Why should we restore wetlands? Well, it's been in the news a lot, um, but the verdict is out as to whether we're having an impact on the ground. It's probably not happening at scale. So why should we be encouraging others and ourselves restoring wetlands? Well, Firstly, we've got ethical and policy obligations to people and nature. And secondly, there are many benefits and we can't afford not to. So this will form, my, the rest of my talk will be arranged into these two parts, which will hopefully make a strong case for the restoration of wetlands. So let's have a look at our ethical and policy obligations. So according to our constitution, everyone has the right to an environment that is not harmful to their health or well-being and the right to have the environment protected. And importantly, this is not just for the present, but for future generations. And this is through measures that prevent pollution and degradation, promote conservation and secure ecologically sustainable development. So that is a very strong case to be protecting our wetlands. In addition, we've got the NEMBA Act, um, which has broad principles gazetted of least harm. So in terms of this mitigation hierarchy, and also national targets for ecosystem preservation. In addition, we have the Ramsar Convention to which South Africa is a contracting party, which should all be managing their wetlands based on a concept of wise use. And this includes the maintenance of the ecological character of the wetland, but also sustainable use of that wetland. Um, it mandates parties to adopt policies and produce wetland inventories and conduct monitoring and re research, as well as raising public awareness and developing management plans. And then we also have the Rio conventions um, and part of that the HE biodiversity targets, which really talk to um, the sustainable use of biological diversity, the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising, um, and also specific targets like conserving at least 17% of certain vegeta of each vegetation type that we delineate for future generations and preventing threatened species extinction. So we have quite a bouquet of ethical and policy obligations to be restoring our wetlands. But there are also a host of benefits that wetlands provide and I'm going to spend the rest of my talk going through these, going through the evidence that we really have that, that investing in wetland restoration provides these returns on investment. So for example, ecosystem services, avoided costs and disaster risk reduction, replacement costs, also social benefits, um, job creation, livelihoods, um, compliance benefits, um, economic benefits, and then also returns on investments. So to start with ecosystem services, um, we have quite a few studies in South Africa on ecosystem services of wetlands and also on wetland restoration. This particular paper 
um, looked at the Krum River catchment and made a case for wetland restoration. Um, it measured specific ecosystem services in quite a lot of detail and hypothesized um, others. So this is just a few services around a wheel um, where the yellow bar indicates whether it's full service provision or some kind of um, variation of that. On the left hand side, we have an intact wetland and you can see that a, an intact wetland is very important for um, provisioning services and regulating services, but not so much for food production. Um, it's not non-existent because we know people did used to eat and still do eat full meat, um, but it's not going to feed a whole city. So food production is low. Intensive agriculture, on the other hand, um, would provide huge amounts of food and maybe also still some recreation and tourism and so on. But all of the other services will be severely impacted. Um, we can look at this part of the chrome where the entire valley bottom has been washed out. And this can also then start to impact that productivity of your food production as well. So it has negative feedback loops. And then some kind of compromise where we look after our wetlands, but also um, have some agriculture. Now, this, this kind of trade off might not always be possible in every system. And this paper in particular calls for governments um, to be a lot more strategic about what type of agriculture we allow where. So if wetlands are only covering a tiny like proportion of the surface of South Africa, like about 2%, then should we be allowing agriculture in those systems or should we be focusing on water production by those systems? So these are just things that need to be thought about strategically. Um, this other study looked at palmite wetlands, um, three different ones in the Tiavadiskloof, the Choka and the Krum, pictured on this map. And um, these palmite wetlands are peatland ecosystems. And this study measured three um, ecosystem services in a lot of detail but also did um, a, ra a rapid um, ecosystem assessment, which is pictured, the results are pictured in these wheels um, of all these ecosystem services rated from one to four or not to four. And so if, if it's um, the area under this graph is high, it means high ecosystem service provision. And you can see the graphs in green tend to have this very high ecosystem service provision, whereas the ones in red have really shriveled. Um, and the difference um, between the green and the red is that the green represents intact wetland and the red um, represents um, degraded wetlands in, in some way, whether it's through agriculture or erosion. And this really makes a strong case that um, healthy wetlands provide many ecosystem services. And in terms of the three ecosystem services that were measured in detail, if you look um, just at the bottom line of this table, degraded wetlands and pristine, you can see, for example, in terms of carbon sequestration, that the rate um, really decreases um, in, for degraded wetlands. Also, in terms of carbon storage, there's a huge amount lost. So carbon sequestration rates are not very high for these wetlands, but when they degrade and the carbon is lost, there's a significant amount of carbon that's released. In terms of water quality or water purification, you can see that it's negative for the degraded wetlands, so they're actually um, polluters. Um, and um, for the pristine wetlands, you can see that it's positive and they're uptaking quite large amounts of nutrients. And then flood attenuation, which um, is significantly reduced when these systems become degraded. Another study, which um, is shown on the right, had the aim of assessing a, a specific method of ecosystem service assessment, a rapid method, but it's quite a useful study to look at because it had a look at which ecosystem services evidence was available for. So here are three different wetland systems, the Manalana wetland, the Krum and the Zoll Club Spret, and the evidence available and the sources. So just to run through this quickly, for the Manalana wetland, um, there's, there's evidence that um, this, these wetlands provide flood attenuation services, stream flow regulation, sediment trapping, erosion control, flood um, the, for the chrome flood attenuation, stream flow regulation, sediment trapping, erosion control, and nutrient and toxicant removal, um, carbon storage, and for the Zolclub spread, phosphate removal, nitrate removal, toxicant removal, and carbon storage. So there's really evidence, it's quantifiable, the services that these wetlands are rendering for society. Um, another study, just zooming into the Zoll Club Spread, actually went a step further and looked at um, wetland rehabilitation. So this is the Zoll Club Spread in the Olifant River catchment. And water quality regulation value of this wetland was estimated. Um, the wetland is located downstream of acid mine drainage. 
and it was estimated to range between 2.6 and 11.4 million rand each year. So the pH of that water when it entered the wetland was severely impacted at around three. By the time it left that wetland, it had been um, purified to about seven. And this is just so critical, demonstrating the value of these wetlands in purifying water. And I can't think of anything worse than being a community being exposed to water that's impacted by acid mine drainage and having a pH of around three. Um, how much more wonderful to be able to access clean water and how critical. There are also socioeconomic benefits, and this is a project called the NatWIP project, which is on nature-based solutions in the peri-urban. And um, this is alien tree clearing along riparian zones and wetlands. And there were some social benefits that were found. People said that through these projects, their connection to nature improved, um, cultural values and practices were changed, there was improved health and well-being, reduced crime, and improved social cohesion. The community also perceived increases in many different types of ecosystem services, and there were also economic benefits of this type of restoration. So job creation, improvements in income, and lower fire risk for landowners. Looking now at the economic value um, and shifting towards South Africa's peatlands, it was estimated in this study pictured here. Um, and the aim was to investigate the potential of these peatlands to act as service providers, focusing on socioeconomic value. So here are South Africa's peatlands. And the key findings of the study was that the presence of peat increases the value of wetlands and the cumulative value is estimated at 174 billion rand. Um, so it's incredibly, these, these peatland systems covering such a small amount of South Africa are incredibly important. In terms of economic viability, another study um, by Blichnode and others, funded by the Water Research Commission, looked at um, eight different restoration projects. Here they are in South Africa, um, different types of restoration, not all wetlands. And then they put this into a systems dynamic model with the aim to inform a portfolio mapping exercise. OK, so here are the results of that, where um, these projects are categorized um, on the y-axis according to net present value, which represents reward, so low reward, high reward, and then the probability of success from low to high. So low reward but high probability of success are your bread and butter things. White elephants are just bad on everything. Oysters have high reward but very high risk. And pearls are just high probability of success, low risk, and high reward. And you can see that most of the projects were pools and especially the water related projects. So this is really critical in terms of economic viability. Another study looked at this slightly differently by looking at the opportunity cost. Um, and this is the foregone benefit that would have been derived by an option not chosen. Um, so this is the particular study and it looked at over 30 um, restoration projects across South Africa, focusing on water, food, biodiversity, many different methods, not all wetland restoration, but these are the um, ones linked to wetland restoration and they include gully restoration. And you can see that the um, opportunity cost is, um, is very, very high. Um, and this is basically the net present value of restoring one additional hectare per year. Um, so in all cases considered the opportunity cost of not restoring is negative, implying that non-restoration translates into a societal lost loss. Um, and then I just wanted to look at this particular table, which is um, now not the marginal values, but the capital values. And you can see that they are between 16 and 50 times greater than the annual values. Um, so we're particularly interested in the NCR projects, which are the non-clearing restoration projects. So it's that um, uh, rehabilitation of wetlands. And you can just see that that opportunity cost is extremely high. And where it fits here on this particular graph, you can see these projects are oysters. So in other words, extremely high return on investment in terms of its um, net present value, but very, very, um, very risky. So not necessarily a high chance of success. This particular graph is flipped around compared to the last one. But um, so just showing that it's important to also consider the opportunity cost and not just the uh, cost and benefits in the present. Then briefly looking at the CB project, which came up with this investment brief shown here, um, looking at several different types of restoration and the impact on e ecosystem services, which you can see are largely positive. 
And just skimming through some of these, you can go and have a look at this um, brief when it's launched in a few weeks. But essentially, there are socioeconomic benefits to people. So um, imp great improvements are the dark blue, moderate improvements are light blue, and no effect is red. But essentially, you can see huge improvements to income, health, education, and environmental awareness. And this was through um, community interviews and interviews of um, people involved in these projects. Also, um, in terms of perceived outcomes due to these investments, um, social networks, skills, income, environmental awareness, and employment were all found to um, significantly increase. And um, many other um, benefits arose as well. In terms of water security, this particular um, study looked at um, wetland drainage. You can see the drainage ditches in red over here um, and represented here in this picture. If these drainage ditches were blocked and the wetland restored, you would see that the, um, the local water table would increase. Um, so this is um, the green scenario relative to the current state, which is the red. Investing in this kind of restoration also builds resilience in terms of climate change. So if we allow alien invasion in our wetlands, um, we increase the potential impact of climate change by 10%. And um, the severity of the southwestern Cape drought, we found um, that 12% of that can be attributed to human-caused climate change. And lastly, there can be a financial argument made um, to do this kind of restoration. And this particular project only looked at alien tree clearing, which is in red here. But over a maturation period of 15 to 20 years, for a certain bond size, you can get an annual return on investment, which is around 7% over 20 years. Now, this is quite nominal and it wouldn't necessarily attract huge investors, but it is a financial return and perhaps coupled with some of these other benefits could result in a strong case. I just wanted to highlight this international study, which also just shows if you only look at profits from a certain land type. So in red is the shrimp farm in Thailand, in green is the mangrove. Of course, a mangrove may not generate as many profits. Perhaps it's only through tourism or fishing. However, if you look at the net public benefits from restoring those mangroves, it, it just blows the private profit, profits out of proportion. And um, the net public cost of um, not doing um, of doing the mangrove restoration is outweighed by that benefit by millions of dollars. So it just makes a case to really consider many factors in calculating whether restoration is profitable. And then finally, um, just want to highlight this business case for the transformative river management program um, that was done in Etiquini, um, which essentially just also shows that ecosystem services are so important and they contribute 4.2 billion rand a year to Durban's economy and they currently are impacted and they could be providing more and if left unattended climate change is going to exacerbate this but essentially what they found was that for every one rand spent investing in riverine management there would be um, a return of about two rand to two to three rand forty to the municipality and in terms of societal benefits. And lastly, just having a look at um, different investor types and what benefits one might get from wetland restoration. This is taken from the CB project investment brief. And I'll just quickly run through these for each sector. Um, it's also just important to consider um, the different potential funders and the different fi financial mechanisms and benefits associated with that. Um, and you can go and have a look at this in CB's um, report. But for example, for corporates, it could be, and um, the mechanisms could be corporate social investment, water stewardship, for institutional investments, investors, it could be bonds and so on, blended finance models. And for landowners and individuals, it could be um, incentive schemes and so on. Okay, so having a look at government, why should government restore wetlands? Restoring wetlands creates jobs. There's a, there's a potential for financial return on investment water security, disaster risk reduction, as well as just good stewardship in terms of our constitution. Why should businesses restore wetlands? Well, for all those same reasons, and also compliance, supply chain security, and also stewardship, so corporate social investments. In particular, there's a special role for insurance companies, for example, to um, incentivize wise and sustainable developments like not building and developing in floodplains, and also improving um, fire risk by clearing invasive alien trees. 
And lastly, for the rest of us, why restore wetlands? Well, there's the added um, component of disaster risk reduction, compliance, um, as well as just stewardship and taking care of what we have. So to conclude, we've got ethical and policy obligations to people in nature to restore wetlands, and we simply cannot afford not to. Thank you very much for listening to this talk.